Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest in our series uh, of uh, weekly podcasts. I am Gabriel Stein, Director, Asset Management Services at Oxford Economics. Uh, and with me um, in voice and spirit, although physically in New York, is Greg Dako, Head of US Macroeconomics, and we're going to discuss the outlook for the United States. Uh, now, Greg, uh, we all know that the Fed raised interest rates um, back in December, and uh, they did it, of course, because they thought the economy was, was strengthening. And recent data, almost ever since, in fact, has generally been disappointing, including, of course, the uh, manufacturing and non-manufacturing ISM service for January and the productivity data for the fourth quarter, which uh, came in uh, quite weak. Um, is the U.S. headed back into recession? Um, I don't think it is uh, in a recession. I don't think it is headed into an uh, imminent uh, recession. I think, yes, there are increased risks of a recession, but I don't think uh, it's, it's imminent uh, in nature. Um, I think that overall the U.S. fundamentals remain quite strong. Uh, we continue to see strong employment growth, uh, moderate, though not stellar, but still moderate uh, wage growth. And the combination of the two is, is leading to solid income growth. Uh, and that is really supporting consumer spending and, and housing. And both of these categories are, are doing quite well, uh, which is quite encouraging for the U.S. economy given their, their uh, large share. Uh, that does not mean there aren't headwinds. There are headwinds from a stronger dollar, from a generally sluggish global environment uh, in terms of, of growth. Um, and uh, the, the question about oil prices. The oil prices are probably now more of a crosswind when it comes to, to the U.S. economy because um, they have impacted, to, to a large extent, um, the investment uh, in, in oil and gas. And uh, the drag from that uh, reduced investment last year was about 0.4 percentage point, which is uh, non-negligible when it comes to, uh, to oil. So um, it is somewhat of a muted growth environment, uh, but I would not call it a recession Though I would highlight that there are risks, um, and uh, the risk would come essentially, in my opinion, from uh, a weakening of, of consumer spending uh, through uh, a negative um, and, and pervasive effect of uh, lower equity prices, lower confidence, lower wealth, and tightening financial conditions. Well, picking up on one of those points, actually, uh, I was going to pick you up on the weak dollar, but we'll or the strong dollar, but we'll get back to that in a minute. But um, picking up on one of the points, which is the wealth effect. Um, now we know, I seem to recall that uh, all studies show that the wealth impact of house prices is twice as important as that of equities, and house price inflation is still relatively decent. So uh, is it actually the case that U.S. households are getting wealthier or they're getting poorer right now? And if they are getting wealthier, um, that should hopefully uh, uh, underpin consumer spending more than the impact of weaker equities. Um, well, in, in, uh, in absolute terms, they're, they're getting wealthier uh, because of the, the, the main reasons you, you highlighted. Uh, wealth is generally defined as having two components, two major components, the financial side and the real estate side. Uh, the financial side actually uh, boomed quite strongly in the, the, the wake of the Great Recession after plunging dramatically. Um, and that helps support, to some extent, consumer spending. But as you state, uh, generally the, the wealth effect from, from financial gains is smaller because the, 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 the participants into, in the financial market are generally the wealthier individuals whose propensity to consume on increased wealth is, is smaller. Whereas the, the real estate wealth uh, typically belongs to uh, a wider range of, of population, and thus increasing home prices means increasing real estate uh, wealth and, and therefore supports uh, spending. So all in all, yes, we are still seeing some favorable signs from the, the housing sector. Um, but I think the real risk is, is more related to, to confidence per se. Uh, in order to have a recession, I, I typically talk about three Ps. A persistent, uh, pervasive, and, and a profound uh, effect on uh, the private sector activity. And, and we haven't seen that yet. Uh, we've seen yet what is a fairly substantial correction in the financial markets. We've seen some increased volatility. Um, but so far, the private sector confidence remains relatively healthy. That does not mean it won't uh, suffer somewhat 
from the decline, but so far uh, we haven't seen that confidence factor uh, which could lead to, to a weaker spending. Um, and financial conditions, though we did have some initial signals potentially on the, the, the commercial and industrial loans front uh, where, where conditions tightened somewhat in the last quarter, um, the, the conditions remain fairly loose and we're, we're still continuing to see lending growth. So, that also is, is an important element uh, that shows that at this point right now, the financial accelerator uh, effect is not yet in place, uh, which could potentially lead us into a recession. Well, we're seeing uh, strong lending growth, that's true, but broad money growth is actually weakening quite sharply, uh, uh, with uh, broad money growing by less than 2% in the year to December. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm a bit uncertain exactly what's happening there. Um, but let's let's leave that aside for the moment, uh, because I'm actually relatively optimistic as well. Let's talk a bit about the strong dollar. You mentioned that as a as a uh, uh, as uh, one of the headwinds for the US economy. Um, but we are in a world right now where where a lot of central banks uh, are attempting to weaken their currencies. Some uh, are doing it explicitly, like the Swiss and Swedish national banks. Um, some are pretending not to do it, but are in fact doing it anyway. I'm referring to the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan. And of course, what's common for all of these four and, and also the Danish national bank is they have, uh, they're using negative interest rates. Um, and um, one of the dangers uh, to the world economy would, of course, be a currency war where everyone is trying to push down their currencies. Uh, and of course, that doesn't work as well. Um, is there, um, and, and, and for, the, for the moment, what we're seeing is that the Fed and to some extent the Bank of England are practicing benign neglect towards their currencies. Is there any danger that the Fed would attempt to uh, move uh, in, uh, move to weaken the dollar significantly vis-à-vis uh, -vis other currencies? Um, I don't think that the Fed would necessarily engage in that type of, of a currency war. Um, I, I don't necessarily uh, believe fully in the, the, the beggar thy neighbor uh, view in which, uh, you know, just by depreciating your currency, you're, you're essentially um, boosting your, your own growth only. I think that uh, in some cases, the fact that uh, some of these currencies have weakened helps export prospects around the world. Uh, and given that U.S. Uh, income growth and, and U.S. consumer spending remains relatively strong, um, we're still expected to see some demand for, for these goods. So I think it's not necessarily the case that we'll see that. But you allude to something that's, that's quite correct, I think. Uh, there is a bit of a catch-22 situation here because um, anytime we see some some weak data or weaker than expected data in the U.S., um, there is an adverse market reaction, and we see these other currencies, vis-a-vis the dollar, actually strengthening somewhat. Uh, and that actually hurts export competitiveness of these economies and weaker growth prospects uh, to some extent around the world. And, and then both the question, are these other central banks going to uh, come up with further solutions, further negative rates or further QE programs or larger QE programs or extended QE programs? Um, and the, the, the other issue is, well, if you get good data in the U.S., then that means the U.S. economy is growing stronger. That means that the Fed will continue to tighten. Uh, it means the U.S. will remain a low growth locomotive, and then the dollar strengthens further, which then weighs on the most trade-intensive sectors, industrial uh, production in, in particular, and some sectors within manufacturing, um, and leads to worries about the U.S. So it's a bit of a catch-22 situation for, for the Fed uh, on that front. Damned if you do, and damned if you don't. Obviously, now one of the things uh, uh, that our uh, that we are forecasting is, of course, that um, a number of central banks will continue to cut negative interest rates, make them more negative. Uh, the European Central Bank, the Riksbank in Sweden, and and almost certainly the Bank of Japan. Um, now, at this stage, uh, one of the uh, questions that comes up from time to time is people saying, "Well, the Fed." Uh, made a mistake to raise interest rates in December, and they are going to reverse this hike. Now, if we assume for a brief moment uh, no significant deterioration in the U.S. economy, uh, it seems to me that in order, and, and I would like to hear your comments on this, it seems to me that in order for the Fed to actually reverse the December rate hike, they would have to ask themselves two questions, and they would have to 
confidently answer both of them in the affirmative. The first question is, would anything have been different if we had not raised interest rates in December? And it seems to me the answer to that question is no. And the second question they would have to ask is, if we do reverse uh, uh, the uh, December rate hike, will the positive impact of that outweigh the negative impact uh, of our loss of credibility, of the fact that we are showing once again that we are market dependent, uh, and the considerably greater difficulty we will have in the future to raise interest rates again. And it seems to me the answer to that question is also no. But what is your view? Leading um, question. Yeah, I think, I think that's actually uh, quite, quite accurate, I think, um, when you talk about a 25 basis point rate hike. Uh, it's not that much of a, a game changer. Yes, it does have some symbolical uh, significance in the sense that, that the Fed is, is embarking on a gradual and, and gradual is important here, uh, the tightening process. But uh, overall, I don't think uh, things would have been much different had the Fed not raised rates uh, and had been telegraphing that uh, for some months. So that wouldn't have changed much. Um, and would the benefits uh, be, be greater than, than the, 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 the downside risks? I think not necessarily. I think if, if we see some moderation of uh, growth, I think the Fed is likely to stay put for longer through 2016. Our current baseline assumption, um, well, last month actually was uh, for June uh, rate hike and uh, December uh, rate hike, so two rate hikes, a very gradual approach to tightening. Uh, we're actually thinking that um, given our latest outlook and, and some relatively more modest uh, growth profile and the fact that lower oil prices are going to lead to somewhat more muted inflation, uh, the Fed might stay put a little bit longer, perhaps uh, until September of this year. So uh, essentially giving itself some time to uh, assess the situation and to ensure that, yes, we are indeed uh, seeing solid employment and uh, market progress and that inflation is coming back as, as we have in the, the Oxford economic uh, baseline. Uh, if those two factors are uh, indeed uh, happening, then, then it would uh, likely raise rates, but again, very gradually, uh, and, and I think that's um, something that's, that's uh, going to happen over the course of, of the next few months. Um, so overall, yes, I think uh, the, you're, you're, you're right that the Fed is not linked to a mark on a negative uh, rate hike uh, or declining or negative rate. Um, spree, but uh, but uh, instead, other state put longer if uh, things do to show signs of slowing. Well, actually, you preempted what was going to be my last question there. What is our view of interest rates? But now we know that. So, uh, Greg Daco, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for uh, listening or downloading this podcast. And we will, of course, be back with uh, more podcasts uh, in the future.